responsibility over the global depopulation policy in the early 1960s, it has been looking for more humane ways to achieve the intended demographic objectives and has concentrated much of its effort and resources on finding psychosocial ways to change the dynamic of family life and to put enough pressure on families and individuals to make it difficult and undesirable to have more than one child. Various countries have encouraged various forms of substance abuse to detract individuals from family life and to cause the dissolution of mostly low-income families by premature death, chronic illness or crippling debt. The West has promoted the use of recreational drugs. China has encouraged excessive tobacco use. And Russia has made alcohol sufficiently cheap and ubiquitous to create a nation of alcoholics. As a result, drug addiction has reached epidemic proportions in many Western countries, and particularly in the US and Canada, where tens of thousands of families are destroyed by drug addiction annually. Smoking deaths have tripled in China over the course of the past decade, and tobacco has become the number one killer, causing 1.2 million deaths a year. By 2030, the number of tobacco-related deaths is expected to reach 3.5 million a year. And it is forecast that if trends continue, a third of all males in China will be killed by tobacco by 2050. Even more disastrous is Russia's alcohol problem. Alcohol consumption has nearly tripled over the past 16 years, and more than half a million Russians die of alcohol-related deaths annually. In no small part, due to alcohol abuse, the life expectancy of Russian males has dropped to 59 years, 17 years lower than their male counterparts in Western Europe. These patterns of substance abuse have dire effects on family formation and family size. The counterculture of the 1960s, which brought about the sexual revolution, was encouraged in order to break the sexual taboos that prevented the mainstream from adopting widespread and uninhibited contraceptive use. It also made drug use socially acceptable and set the stage for the introduction of ever more destructive drugs, both legal and illegal, creating a drug market and an underground economy that relies on drugs and prostitution, is antithetical to families and has become a breeding ground for HIV AIDS. The hippie counterculture of the 1960s was followed by the lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender, the LGBT counterculture of the 1970s and 1980s, which brought about acceptance for and decriminalization of homosexuality in time for the explosion of LGBT caused by the effects of long-term exposure to fluoride, which raises the incidence of sexual confusion from a naturally occurring level of about 4% to an artificially high level of 15%. The most subtle and insidious form of population control is the manipulation of the law to criminalize formerly acceptable social behaviors and domestic quarrels and to incarcerate a large percentage of the poor in order to prevent them from forming families and raising children. Throughout the Western world, and especially in the US, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, this form of population control fulfills the eugenic requirements of the policy as it targets primarily minorities and the poor. The Zero Tolerance Domestic Law, Minor Drug Offenses and the Three Strikes Law are typical examples of legislation designed to fulfill the requirements of the global depopulation policy. The Zero Tolerance Domestic Law is designed to break families apart at the slightest conflict by removing discretionary powers from the police and giving the state the authority to go over the wishes of spouses to press criminal charges that result in bankruptcy and family dissolution. Conflicts that could be resolved in the privacy of homes within minutes or days are given the status of violent crime to destroy families, separate parents from children, and to transfer their wealth to the judicial class. The Three Strikes Law mandates harsh sentences for anyone who has been convicted of two felonies and who upon being convicted of a third felony faces life in prison. It was first applied in Washington State in 1993 and then in California in 1994 
to compensate for their lack of fluoridation due to popular opposition, and then spread throughout the western seaboard for the same reason. As a result of such eugenic laws, hundreds of thousands of families are broken apart annually in the English-speaking world as well as in several European countries. In the US, the judiciary has become the primary tool for eugenic objectives, giving America the dubious distinction of being the nation with the highest incarceration rate in the world, and also in history, at 743 adults behind bars per every 100,000 citizens. When people on correctional supervision and on house arrest are factored in, the US far surpasses even Stalinist Russia in the number and proportion of prisoners to the general population. Statistics also show that visible minorities bear the brunt of the incarceration mania that has gripped the United States and to a lesser extent much of the Western world. Canada ravages its native population by this method. Europe's statistics, as well as Australia's, are skewed by the fact that immigrants are held in separate detention centers and are not counted as imprisoned. Economic pressures are also used to create an environment that is hostile to families and especially to the raising of children. The United Nations' favorite method for reducing the number of children is women's participation in the workforce. In the name of poverty eradication, women's education and employment have been given the highest priority. To this end, women in the developing world are being encouraged to get educated and forced to leave their traditional place at home to seek employment. A working woman has less time for children and therefore less incentive to have children. A working woman will also delay childbearing to satisfy career ambitions or the demands of the labor market. But since women make up 51% of the global population, the steady influx of women into the labor market depresses wages worldwide at a time when unemployment is already a chronic problem the world over. This mass migration of women into the workforce is also displacing men economically, disrupting traditional patterns of life, confusing gender roles, and pitting men against women, all of which aid the cause of achieving smaller and fewer families. The demand for excessive and unnecessary credentials is the means by which entrance into the workforce is delayed in the developing world so as to prevent young people from starting families early in life when their biological clocks make them most fertile. The average age for women to have children in Europe and Japan is 29, while in the US it is 25. Throughout the developed world, women today have their children at least four years later than women in 1970. In the first half of the 20th century, when the population was not subjected to social engineering, European women had their children in their late teens and early 20s. By delaying entrance into the workforce, both men and women, an entire decade has been shaved off from women's childbearing years. The media is being used to condition people to be rabid consumers and to dedicate their incomes to excessive materialism rather than invested in children as previous generations did. The consumption of goods and services in ever greater amounts has become man's primary preoccupation in the socially engineered post-World War II era, giving rise to a consumer society that is self-centered and has relegated children to secondary status. Foreign aid followed by World Bank loans and then by IMF austerity programs have intentionally created spiraling debt in the developing world to deprive poor nations of the revenue needed to invest in infrastructure and social programs. Coupled with plummeting commodity prices and Western protectionism, this has become the formula for poverty that the developed world has imposed on the developing world to create economic conditions that are hostile to families. Monetary coercion has replaced military conquest to control the resources and destinies of other nations. This is done to halt the population explosion that prevents the developing world from catching up with the needs of its growing population, as much as it is done for the rich world's self-serving need 
to secure access to vital resources on foreign soil. This catch-22 situation is the cycle of poverty that the architects of the global depopulation policy hope to break worldwide by instituting tough medicine now on nations that are late newcomers to population control measures. The population control lobby is rightfully concerned that 90% of the people born in the past 50 years in the world were born in the developing world, thus in countries that were already poor and could least afford unrestricted population growth. How can the church claim moral authority over Christendom, while at the same time keep secret its knowledge of the world's greatest genocide? How could Pope after Pope since the early 1950s appear before their adoring worshippers to bless them and guide them through life, while knowing that each and every one of them is being slowly poisoned into extinction, and in the process, irreparable harm is done to their health and well-being. These are questions that we'll hopefully be able to answer over the next few days here in Rome. For the time being, I want to say this to Pope Francis. There can be no church without people. There can be no humanity without compassion. There can be no trust without honesty. And there can be no faith without truth. Speak the truth, Pope Francis, and deliver us from evil. You have the ability. Use it. You have our trust. Honor it. Otherwise, Christ will have died in vain.